global economic climate change in the future so that things that we aren't even thinking of today, or can, let's just brainstorm about things that might happen, or is that too burdensome and costly and time consuming to even attempt? What I think boards generally, and the Intrepid Board is definitely this way, they want to focus on strategic risk. You know, it, it deals more with risk reward. You know, this is just looking at risk. And when you're running a company or building a company, what you want to do is believe that you have a better ability to assess risk reward than other people. And you're going to, take, you're going to purposely take risks but get a better return. So that's kind of what the board wants to focus on, is those types of big strategic decisions and thinking, you know, how do you take risks like that? And if you, the way that boards do that is they hire hopefully a competent management team that has an ability to assess those things and they trust that management team to run the company. Um, there's other risk mitigation and risk monitoring systems that are put in place, especially if you're a public company, like Sarbanes-Oxley. So that's why our CFO, Dave, wasn't as enthusiastic about this because he's already overwhelmed from taking the company, a private company to a public company, and having all these different things he already has to monitor based on Sarbanes-Oxley, which is a government regulatory system that costs <coughs> over a million dollars a year just to implement that stuff. Uh, we had implemented ISO. So we have a lot of processes in place to monitor kind of key risks from an operating standpoint, from a HR standpoint. So we had a comprehensive system in place, but those didn't meet the requirements from a board reporting perspective. Um, I said the other thing the board feels as a, gen as a general group, and this, it's bigger boards, smaller boards, you know, big companies, small companies differ in this, but in terms of entropic, they felt like the risk management task associated with this particular project fell on the audit committee, kind of the chairman of the audit committee. So they wanted to delegate that to the audit committee and the audit committee would report back. So Karen actually spent more time on this than less than an hour. But um, the entire board, you know, they trust Ken, they trust Lance, and said, hey, this looks like it meets the requirements of what we need to do. You know, we don't want to spend a whole lot of money or a whole lot of extra time on this to kind of check that box, you know, CYA, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think it did provide some insight. You know, I think what we didn't talk about was every quarter our outside attorneys, Lance, Dave, our CFO, they would go through this comprehensive process of looking at our risk factors and all those. Some of them are CYA type of you know, risk factors that you have to put into financial statements. Um, a lot of them are things that could you know, possibly happen and you try to put them out there the best way you can. What it really comes down to is the, the most important thing from a management perspective is assessing risk reward and hopefully doing that better. And having hired people with integrity because you can put whatever process in place and if people don't operate with integrity, you still have a huge problem. Yeah. So do you think you will focus and refine the process or do you think you just get to the point where you're going to keep the process where it is right now? Well, I'm no longer with the is now being in the process of being merged with another high tech company in San Diego called Max Linear. So it's kind of a Max Linear question. They, I'm sure they have to do something as a public company um, to kind of check the box associated with this. And a lot of that, I don't, I haven't talked to Kishore about this. He's the CEO and founder of Max Linear. But they, I don't know what are the processes that have in place. Do they want to adopt this? Do they already have things that check the box for them? Yeah. We sort of realize that you are sort of in a way sort of become with the checkbox mentality. What do you think needs to happen to sort of get ERM out of this checkbox mentality and people really sort of start thinking outside the, the box? Well, I, I think a lot of it depends upon the size of the company. You know, there's a huge amount of burden on smaller, kind of small cap, mid cap public companies to implement a lot of stuff to meet the ongoing regulatory environment, and this is just another thing that you're dumping on these companies that really don't have the resources to do this process and this process and this process, plus you do that the processes that you already have in place that you put in place to run your business. Like, even ISO was more to check the box with some key customers, but there's underlying things we did, you know, from an operational standpoint, from a financial accounting perspective, so we're doing a lot of things, but then you're layering all this stuff on top of it. Um, that's a huge risk for small companies because you know if you have process for process 
mistake and you're just being bureaucratic and you're a slave to the process instead of the process being a tool that you use during the company, that becomes a huge problem. So I think there's a minimum scale that you have to have. Maybe it's a billion in revenue, maybe it's a certain number of employees, maybe a dedicated risk manager. Then this kind of stuff makes sense and you can maybe comprehensively weave that in with the other things that you're doing. But for a small company, it's just, it becomes another duplicate thing. It was a requirement by the board because the board's freaked out. You know, hey, we got to do something that we're actually able to monitor risk. I'm like, hey, we're monitoring it, doing this, this, and this, but that didn't meet their requirement. <coughs> so I put this in place to help with that. <coughs> yeah. Do you think that the benefit, or did you, do you think that you guys got any benefit from implementing the DRM? I, I think so, even though Ken kind of understated or, you know, it was in, in the case talking to Lance, kind of the, there wasn't a level of cooperation cross-functionally. I think there was more <coughs> of a, that, that's an area where any size company where things fall through the cracks is when you have something that's interdepartmental and nobody, I think it's that guy's response. It's like when two baseball players run into each other in the outfield and they don't catch the ball. So I think there was some level of discussion around that and we picked up some things that probably wouldn't have been picked up just in kind of our normal process of going through the 10K risk factors. So there was, there was some benefit there. I think there was also some benefit in terms of assigning ownership Whereas previously, maybe the ownership wasn't as clear and the ownership was more clear after going through this process. And Ken did skip one step. Lance talked to me first because he knew that if he didn't talk to me and I wasn't going to be a hammer on everybody else to make sure they got it done, it wouldn't get done. So there was, there was resistance because nobody wants to do extra stuff when they already feel overwhelmed.